So as Brent said, um, I work with the National Marine Fisheries Service. We're based in the Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. I want to acknowledge two people um, who all of the data that I'm going to present today have been a big part of it. Um, Bob Malone, who has started the program at San Miguel in 1968, and has been the guiding hand of it, and his dedication to it over the last 45 years has, has given us the data that I'm going to show you today. And Jeff Lake is our trusty biostatistician who keeps us honest. Okay, so the goal of the program, as I said, it's been going for a long time. Um, it was started initially to monitor population growth of the pinnipeds there, all the species. Um, we had a, a focus of the program is really on these uh, four topics, uh, competition for space and food among all the pinnipeds, environmental, but that's both um, within species and between species, environmental changes like El Nino, decadal oscillations and climate change, and disease, um, that's kind of been a, a more um, a bigger issue in recent years, and human interactions, um, fisheries, contaminants, pathogens, other sorts of things that might happen by interacting with people. Today I'm just going to focus on our California Sea Lion Research Program, um, which is our longest running program along with our Northern Free Seal, Free Seal Program. And just to let you know, everything I'm presenting today, we have parallel data for Northern Free Seals. This program consists of, of five pieces. We do annual counts of live and dead pup um, that provide trends in births and mortality, annual sampling and weighing of three month old pups for trends in health and condition, long term mark reciting uh, study using branded individuals that provides estimates of survival and mortality, and the last two kind of go together satellite telemetry and our collection of stats every year for um, foraging information. I'm going to go light on methods here, but if you guys have any questions later, I'd be happy to, to expound on them. Uh, the reproductive season for California sea lions runs from mid-May to mid-August. Females give birth to a single pup over a six-week period, and that's followed 30 days later by breeding. We measure the total number of births um, at the end of July using our live pup counts and dead pup counts up to that point in time. We measure early pup mortality from the cumulative number of dead pups from July through the end of September. We brand pups at three months old in the end of September, and we measure them and weigh them and take blood samples from them for condition of disease. And then survival from branded pups um, to their first year, and annual survival of non-pups is determined from reciting data that comes during the breeding season at San Miguel Island and on the Nuevo Island up north. So I'm going to start with pup births, mortality, and condition. These are our main trends, uh, trend indicators. This is the analog pup count at San Miguel Island um, from 1975 to 2012. On the y-axis is the number of pups in thousands. You can see it's been a pretty steady increase, um, up to about 25,000 pups in recent years. But I want you to notice there's a couple um, big drops here in live pups, and those are all associated with El Nino except for one. And the other thing I want you to notice is that it doesn't always have the same effect on the live pups. Sometimes it causes a drop and it takes it a long time to recover as it did in the 19, after the 1981, 82, 83 event. Um, it can sometimes be very abrupt and very fast recovery, like in the 97, 98 El Nino. And that has to do with when the El Ninos occur relative to the reproductive season, how intense they are, how long they last, um, can have very different effects. And then the last thing I want to point out is in 2009, which is sort of a strange year, we actually had almost 25,000 pups born in that year. But by the time we did the live pup counts at the end of July, we had lost most of them to starvation. And there was um, a regional relaxation event, they called it, in the central California uh, coast in May and June of that year. Um, that was a catastrophic um, collapse in upwelling. So females that were out trying to forage after they just had a pup couldn't find any food. And so we had a huge mortality event. And you can see that here. This is the cumulative pup mortality. This is a shorter time series from 1997 to 2012. This is from birth to three months of age. The blue bars represent what we call early pup mortality, which is up to six weeks of age. And it's that mortality that's included in our total birth count. The yellow represents the, what we call late season mortality, which is from six weeks to three months, or basically to the time of branding. There's a couple of things I want you to notice here. One is that the average, of, if you just look at the blue bars, the average is about 20%. That's kind of their normal mortality. 
In the El Nino in 1998, it jumped up to 40%, and that's pretty standard for El Nino events. And then you can see the 2009 event, um, where we had 74% of the mortality occur in that first six weeks of the season. And then here, um, from 2001 to 2005, um, you can see that the, normally the, the late season mortality only attributes about 8 to 10% of the total mortality over the first three months. But in these years, from 2001 to 2005, it was closer to equal to or more than the early season mortality. That one is caused by a combination of hookworm disease, which is always in the population, is one of the reasons we have this kind of steady mortality, part of the reason. Um, but also in those um, five years, we also had a pneumonia that was running in the population and just had really, the combination of those two things had a really lethal effect on pups. Once that pneumonia went out of the population, we went back to sort of normal mortality. This is our condition index. These are our pups at three months of age. I'm only going to show you females, but the males look just the same, only they're about a kilo and a half to two kilos heavier. Um, so here on the y-axis is the mean pup weight of females at three months of age. This is the long time series again from 1975 to 2012. The blue dots are normal years and the red are El Nino years. First thing you notice is that in El Nino years we drop, the mean weight drops about two to four kilos. Again, sometimes for one year, sometimes for two. Again, depending on the intensity of the event, when it occurs relative to the time we weigh the pups. And that shows here, if you look at 2010, that last red dot, um, it's kind of up there with the normals, even though that was supposed to be an El Nino year. And that was because the El Nino ended in May of 2010. So by the time we weighed pups in September, um, they weren't really feeling the effects of the El Nino any longer. The other thing I want you to notice is I put a regression line on here over the whole time series, not including the El Nino points, so this is just for the normal data, and it's about a 5.5% decline in the average pep weight over the 37 years. Um, we're sort of looking right now, we're analyzing those data now to look at what could be responsible for that. That uh, ends up being about 2 kilos um, over that whole time period, lower weight now. And one thing that jumps out, you might notice that there is that 1989 was a big regime shift um, in the California current. And that, that does look like it's also a shift in these puff weights. But then we had another big shift in 1999, which doesn't seem to really show up, um, which was supposed to be a better foraging conditions. Um, so we're kind of looking around for different things now, we're looking at a number of different oceanographic indices and disease factors that might explain those trends. So now I'm going to move on to the survival and mortality, which come from our marking program. We brand, tag, and weigh 200 to 500 pups at three months of age. We brand them every year, uh, about 26 cohorts up until 2012. So far, we branded over 10,000 uh, animals, because we're close to 11,000. Um, we skewed the sex ratio starting in 1993 to allow better estimate of mortality rates. For the analysis, um, we're only, I'm going to show you today, I'm just going to show you the 1987 to 2000 cohorts. It represents over 6,000 females and 3,000 males. The resightings are between 1990 and 2009 at San Miguel Island, Anuevo Island, and along the California coast. Survival was estimated using the Cormac Jolly Seaver model with a host of variables, time, age, sex, up weight at the time of branding, the reproductive status of individuals, the multivariate ENSO index was used as an indicator of El Nino conditions. And demonic acid and leptospirosis strandings provided by the Southwest Region and the Marine Mountain Center were used as an index of disease. The tally was estimated using a pop and open robust model. It included a, um, only females that had been observed with a pup at least once, and the recite history began at age four, which is when they become reproductive. Much easier models here, just time, age, and the MEI or El Nino. So starting with pup and yearly survival, this is the, along the this is going this is an annual graph. Um, the other one I'm going to show you is age specific. So here on your uh, x-axis are the residing years from 1992 through 2007 in annual survival. In red is the pup survival, and green is the yearlings in the same year. And so there's a couple of the models that were selected for this indicated uh, fitting different models by year because there's so much variability. You can see that the average survival for pups ranges from 0.33 in the El Nino year there in 1997, all the way up to 0.93 for females. Males are a little bit lower, 0.257 to 0.911. Um, 
yearlings, um, same sort of story, a lot of annual variability, also affected primarily by El Nino. Um, and they follow the pups actually pretty well until the later part of the series when they start diverging in terms of their survival. Pup survival and yearling survival were both dependent on the weight of the pup at the time of branding. So if a pup was a kilo heavier than the average, it had a 12% higher increase in survival, both as a pup and as a yearling. So it was a carryover effect to two years old. And survival for both groups, as I said, reduced during El Nino. One thing I want to point out here, the El Nino in 1992, you see the drop in um, pup survival and in yearling survival, but also notice that the yearlings in 1991 were also low, and then in 1997, both were low, female or pups and yearlings, but then um, the yearlings were made low in 1998. And that is again a reflection of El Nino and its patterns. Um, oftentimes for yearlings, it affects, the, the year that the El Nino starts, it affects the yearlings that are weaned in that year. El Nino's often last more than a year, so by the time you come around to the next weaning age group, um, they're still being impacted. So that's why it often has a, a two-year effect. And then this is a little more complicated. Lots of information on this slide, so I'll go a little slow. This is the sex and age-specific results from, from the models that we ran. On the left is your females. On the right is survival of males by age group on the bottom. And this is the average annual survival because for um, the animals older than two years old, um, year really didn't matter all that much, so we basically averaged them. And for the pups and yearlings, just to complete the graph, um, those are averaged over time. It has a typical mammalian pattern, dome-shaped with lowest survival occurring for the youngest and oldest animals, for both males and females. You see, they have pretty high survival once they hit two years old, um, up to 0.9 or greater for females and 0.84 or greater for males. For 12-year-olds, um, once you get a little bit old, like all of us, they start falling off a little bit, uh, 0.6 um, to 0.88 for females and 0.55 to 0.74 for males. For sex, basically, sex was not that important for um, pups or yearling survival, somewhat surprisingly, um, but once they got to two years old and older, males tended to have slightly lower survival than females for the same ages. And reproductive status is indicated here with the red lines. Sorry, I didn't tell you that. The blue lines are the non-reproductive animals, and the red lines are reproductive animals. So the, for females, the reproductive females have slightly higher um, survival, which is a little bit surprising. And we think maybe that means that females that don't reproduce are just unhealthy throughout their lives, and so they die at a younger age. Uh, for non-reproductive males, they had greater survival than their reproductive counterparts. Um, that's not surprising, considering that males do a lot of territorial defense and fighting once they become reproductive. Also notice the large variability in those older age classes for both females and males. That's a reflection of the fact that by the time they get to be that old, we don't have very many left. So the precision of those estimates is not as good. And a few other things on survival factors for those um, for age and sex specific and older animals. Um, the El Nino or the MEI index um, was important for two year olds. It reduced their survival by 26%, both for males and females. Three to four year olds' survival reduced by 8% for both males and females. And once they were five years old or older, El Nino didn't impact survival. Demonic acid affected females only and reduced the survival of females that were two years old or older by 3% um, per 100 strandings. And for leptospirosis, it affected males only, reduced survival for animals two years or older by 31% for 100 standings. So that's a pretty big effect when we have lepto outbreaks. In tally, it was much simpler. The best model only resulted in two groupings from four to 16 years old and from 17 to 21. The natality rate is here on the left. And I should note that natality is different from reproduction. It's, it's the number of pups that actually are born alive. So this is, not, this is not pregnancy. Um, the, the 416 group um, is about 0.77, um, averaged over years. And for the older females, 17 to 21, it drops a bit to 0.56. LEO impacts both age groups, um, drops the natality about 20%. One of the interesting findings of, of this study was that females born during an El Nino, or if they experienced an El Nino before they were four, they delayed their recruitment a year to two years. 
And finally, I just threw this in because I know Mark's going to talk about food habits, and I knew Claudia was going to talk about um, Mexico. Um, this is probably one of the coolest things we've done recently for foraging. This is a collaborative effort um, between UC Santa Cruz, Terry Coon, and Dan Costa, Mark Lowry's Health and Fisheries Science Center, and ourselves to try to instrument um, females, lactating females, at three of the islands in the Channel Islands. So in the winters of 2005 and 2006, we instrumented animals at San Nicholas Island, which is on the left, and at San Miguel Island on the right in the green. And in 2008, we instrumented animals at San Clemente Island, which is in the blue on the right-hand side. Um, these are data from about November to February, and all these females were believed to have pups, so they were all tied to the islands. And what I want you to know is how nicely um, the San Nicolas data would fit right in that, that spot um, between San Miguel and San Clemente on the right-hand side. Um, it appears that these species are partitioning um, their foraging space by colony. Um, and that, that can have some pretty dramatic impacts on how we think about them in terms of population dynamics. Um, if they're feeding in different areas, then they're going to be exposed to different environmental pressures, possibly to different diseases, um, maybe even to different human contaminants, fishing pressures, and other sorts of things. So we need to be thinking about them um, as one population, but also about the kind of intricacies of each of the colonies. So to summarize, puffers, mortality, condition, pup and juvenile survival, and adult female mortality, uh, all reduced during El Nino, and the regional warming event in 2009, um, I didn't show you the most recent data because we're still working on it, but it affected all of those parameters as well, almost as if it was an El Nino. Disease, a uh, very important regulator. It affects survival of all those groups, both sexes. Um, I think probably in the future, um, disease is going to be a pretty important aspect of, of monitoring these populations. And particularly, it would be best if we could do it at all the colonies. And finally, um, partitioning of the foraging areas by colonies um, leads to different population trends. Um, I guess that's all I've got. <laughs>